I'm Mike McDermott, one of the founders of FreshBooks, a longtime CEO. And today on the show, we're going to talk about how you can perpetuate a great culture, given how hard that is to do, blind dates in the workplace. And I'm going to share uh, some missteps I made around leading people in hopes you can uh, learn from them and maybe not repeat them. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, he's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives. Let me ask you, what do you need to do to up-level your leadership? I'm curious, have you ever met someone that you had some not so great preconceived ideas about. And then when you met them, you were blown away about how well you got along. You see, one of the challenges that many employees have to face is that all too often they feel like they're thrown into the lion's den. Too often they start a new corporate position without knowing who they report to, let alone who they're actually working with. So what if there's a way to fast track the whole thing, quickly collapsing the preconceived ideas, and have old and new employees bond super quickly to build a corporate culture. Well, stay tuned, because that's exactly where we're going on today's show. I'm your host, Dov Barron. I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything by transforming meaning into action. To find out more, you can simply go to dovbaron.com. That's D-O-V-B-A-R-O-N.com. This episode of Leadership and Loyalty is brought to you in part by our other podcast, Curiosity Bites. Curiosity Bites is the answer to the question, how can we bring people together who completely disagree? This is exactly what your heart and mind and soul have been craving. It's your chance to sit in on some real and often very intense conversations with some of the world's most interesting people. We're talking about quantum physicists, neuroscientists, philosophers, holy people, astronauts, skeptics, entrepreneurs, Grammy award-winning artists, and a whole bunch of other people who you might think I would never listen to them, and you'll find them truly fascinating. Simply go to dovebaron.com and find out how you can sign up for and sink your teeth into the delicious Curiosity Bites. As always, you can find this podcast and Curiosity Bites on anywhere that you normally listen to podcasts, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever you tune in. And by the way, we always need your help in staying relevant. So please get over there, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. We really appreciate it. If you are a regular listener, a big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. We are honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. You can also catch us on Google Home and Alexa by simply saying Play Dog Baron Podcast. All right. Thank you for sharing the show with everybody. Now let's strip it down and dive right in. The vaccines may be here, but remote leadership is not going away. Now more than ever, it is vitally important to stay connected to everyone in your team. Yet even with all the marvelous technologies we have, it's increasingly difficult to maintain a genuine connection with your team, particularly when you can't just walk around the office. As a result, some corporate cultures are already buckling under the strain. So how can you create a bonded corporate culture where everyone knows and cares about each other? Well, what if you and your team could all go on non-romantic blind dates to find out about each other and your corporate culture? Well, that's exactly what we're going to do today. That's what we're going to find out all about because our guest today is a man for whom leadership and loyalty are things he is deeply committed to. Mike McDermott is the executive chair and co-founder of FreshBooks. His insights come from spending nearly 20 years building a global team of 500 committed, what he calls FreshBookers. FreshBooks is the number one accounting software in the cloud. Built out of frustration, Mike spent three and a half years growing FreshBooks from his parents' basement. Ooh, the basement thing again. 
<laughs> Since launching in 2003, over 24 million people have used FreshBooks to save time billing and collecting billions of dollars. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Good to have you here, mate. Thank you for joining us. So where we always like to start the show is this place. In this time where everybody is an expert and everybody is an influencer and all that other nonsense, who is somebody that we might not think of or may not imagine who's been a major influence on you and your leadership, maybe out, out of the out of the normal? Um, well, I think I'm going to give you two two North Stars that may not be non-obvious to you. I, I sure. you know, they're, they're an inspiration to me, not not direct influencers. And sure. those would be um, Isidore Sharp, the founder uh, uh, of of the Four Seasons uh, hotel chain, uh, and the other is Danny Meyer of uh, Union Square um, Cafe and a variety of other uh, hospitality endeavors. Actually, the founder of Shake Shack as well. Uh, and and I think uh, so. Th those would be those would be two. And the reason the thread would be what Danny would call hospitality and what I might call experience. So if you, when you look at that, and you know, and you're talking to our listeners, our viewers, what is the the single thread message that you have from Isidore and from Danny that you'd say? Listen, I don't care what business you're in, this is what I got from these guys that it will serve you well as a leader to do. Yeah, I think I think it's 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 hard to go to one one thing. So let me just walk it back for you. So sure. I would say, hey, um, first of all, starting with the customer and working backwards. And so as soon as you start with the customer or you get yourself in their shoes, you know you want to be treated well. And so I, I think if you think about what those two uh, founders and leaders have done is they have perpetuated excellence in sort of scaling culture and hospitality. I, I think of that as a forever game. It mm. is so hard to sustain. And what it takes you to really quickly is culture because it's the culture that perpetuates the excellence. It's not the you know, which, you know, is going to be one part process and what have you, but, but it is, it is, it is the culture. And, um, and so then it's like, okay, how do we edit, curate, you know, affect culture to sustain and perpetuate excellence so that, that it happens. And, you know, and then it's like, oh, well, what is culture? And, and to me, culture is what happens when nobody's looking, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's, how do you, how do you make great things happen for your customer? And, and I think importantly, your, your employees will talk about this probably as we go along. Um, and I think if you can do those two things uh, reliably, sustainably, consistently, good things will happen for your shareholders. Yeah, too often I think that companies believe that culture is that thing, that brochure that they handed out to everybody when they started. And I always say that ain't your culture. Your culture is what's happening when you're not looking. So I, I fully agree with you. I think it's it's so often missed that, well, these are our rules and this is the culture. No, you have a subculture that's actually the culture. And that's what I say is permission. It's what you what e they give each other as permission. And so what you're talking about is setting it up so that it is going on while you're not looking in the way that you want it to look, in the way that you want it to be. But how do you how do you do that? Because that, that's a big question for everybody. Because you know, they, they can all define it, but how do you do it when you're not there? Um, well, listen, let's, let's uh, so how, do you, how do you do it? And, and uh, let's just go with the definition and, and yeah. make it clearer. Because I, I think you're right. I, I've, you know, been speaking to people and they'll be like, well, we've heard great things about your company. There's like ping pong tables, there's dogs. And it's like, wait a second, that's not the culture, right? No. To, to me, you know, you can have two companies in identical industries, same scale or whatever. In one company, you walk down the hallway, there's a piece of garbage on the floor and you keep walking. In another company, somebody walks down the floor, the piece of garbage on the floor, they pick it up. The difference, the difference is culture. And so that's, you know, I, I like, I think you think you get a lot of things for free as a leader in an organization if you, if you get the culture sort of organized correctly. And so, so the question becomes, oh, okay, how, how do we do that? Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that is that has kind of been my last sort of 15, 20 years trying to figure it out. I'm I'm someone who's never worked anywhere else. 
um, you know, of any scale or, or significance. I kind of like was like a summer camp counselor leading, you know, 20, 30 day canoe trips was like the only real employment I had. And so I hadn't worked in a corporate environment. And um, this notion of culture was was basically just a huge mystery for me. And so I've been trying to unpack and understand it. And so, uh, you know, what have I come to learn on the other side of that that journey, which, you know, I think is a, a forever journey I'm still working on, but, but is, um, uh, you know, is, is a couple things. Uh, you know, I, I, I have some philosophical beliefs and let's unpack those quickly. Um, I, I think you need shared values and alignment to be successful. So it's, it's like, hey, do we have a common, you know, when push comes to shove, is there some underlying set of values? I'm not saying we have the same politics. You know, I'm not saying the color of our skin is the same or we're the same gender, but underneath, is there a value set that is shared? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that is that is a really, really important thing. And so um, I think if you you understand that principle, you know, companies have a job to do to go ahead and articulate, hey, what are our values? Uh, you know, and, and and to recruit people who they believe very easily and very naturally will will, you know, it's not so much adhere to, but it, it's just kind of live those values mm -hmm. and do a good job of helping people leave if if that's a struggle for them and a non-natural uh, kind of act. So that's, you know, that is thing one. And then the job is once you get those people in, um, you need to recognize and acknowledge uh, when people do live those values and, and yes. perhaps in a more extreme way. Uh, and shine a light on that and reward people and acknowledge it and do it publicly and all that stuff is you you basically shine a light on the values you want perpetuated. <laughs> and if you encounter things that are transgressions, you deal with them sort of swiftly behind the scenes and saying, hey, that's a non-starter. By the way, if it happens again, you're going to have to leave. <laughs> mm -hmm. Full stop. Like it's it's that simple. And so you get, you know, and, and if you can do those two things, you get the people that have those values living them you know, and uh, accentuating that. And I mean, that all, I mean, hopefully that's concrete enough, but, but you know, it is, it is, well, uh, it is. The, the, you know, the, the, the interesting thing about it that uh, uh, often it, uh, companies have to confront is <clears throat> if you have an employee who wants to work for you, they will go to your website, look at your values and they will regurgitate those values to you. And that's not honest, um, but it's people who want a job. I understand it. Um, and, and I think that the problem is that oftentimes in a culture that we're interviewing for the cultural values, but we're not paying attention to whether they're lived. And so what you're saying that I use, um, I use a term called non-negotiables. And, and that means that, you know, we asked you about this when you came in, it was you, you showed your, you said you were aligned. We're seeing that this is not in alignment. So maybe you thought you were aligned and you're not, maybe you knew you weren't aligned, but this is non-negotiable. Are, are we clear? Because if it isn't for you, if it doesn't work for you, that's okay. As Tony Shea said, let's pay you to go away because you're actually gonna, you're gonna cost us more money, uh, more time, more energy, and more morale. So I think you're absolutely right. It, it requires us to go past the interview. And I think that's where a lot of companies fall down with this is our culture. These are, these are our values. Oh, yes, of course, I agree with that. Oh, yeah, you know. And a lot of times these are kind of nebulous subjective words, meaning like, you know, we're all about service. What the hell does that mean? We're about innovation and integrity. These are subjective words that don't have a lot of understanding. So I think you've got to help people to understand what that means in our culture. Yeah, a, a couple things just to, to just take it a, a little deeper because it's really important uh, for people sure. to understand. So at the risk of saying things twice, let me let me just uh, go there as well. Um, the first thing is we have a, a value at FreshBooks that we call trust, and it's you know basically boils down to um, we give trust or we give trust to earn trust, and if you know when in doubt, we trust other people have our best intentions in mind. And so you know when we're interviewing people. You know, I think it's a critical stage to your point. And, you know, for me, um, I, I think organizations and people, and we'll talk about a little bit of how to do this. I think the job is not to let people tell you that they live the values or, you know, have memorized them or play them back. It's like you, you need to seek out in their answers, you know, a consistent pattern by which, you know, they live uh, their values and so, or your values. And so, 
that that is the therein is a struggle. And, and by the way, I, I think what you learn pretty quickly is, oh, that comes with pattern recognition. Like I hadn't worked anywhere before. I didn't know anything about hiring. So now I've hired, you know, hundreds of people. And, you know, I, I'm much better at the pattern recognition now than I, sure. than I was. And so, so I think, and, and so this is where a lot of companies are starting to get like these concept of bar raisers and in their interview process mm -hmm. where, um, you know, the people who are really good at that pattern recognition part to say, okay, it's great that you've got the expertise, the hiring manager really likes you, they want to bring you in. But now it's like, I'm going to come at this from a slightly different angle. And I'm going to look for things that are going to be hard for you to regurgitate. And now people who've, you know, interviewed with me, you'll find it's like, you know, you don't know which way that interview is going to go next, right? It's, it's uh, you know, we're going to cross a bunch of your experience and I'm going to want to know how you think about things. I'm going to look for specific examples and it's going to move so quickly that you're going to be behaving naturally uh, pretty quickly. And, and you can start to suss out, okay, like, is this somebody going to be reliably, predictably when they don't know the way are they going to behave in the ways that we would expect or not? And, and people have their own style to it. And you may find as a leader, hey, I'm just not good at this. You mm -hmm. know, the organization likes me. I'm a fit. So I need to lean on someone else or something else to get at this in the interview stage. But with all of that said, uh, Dove, I, I do agree. I think after that, we have we actually have, and I, on the one hand, I don't like this, but we have like a 90-day um, period of, of uh, you know, sort of expectation of like, hey, we're going to, we're, we're kind of continuing to evaluate for 90 days because mm -hmm. it's so important. And, you know, I, what I don't like is that puts people on the little bit, not everybody, but some people are like, oh, they're really minding that 90 days. And for me, that's, that's kind of not the point. Uh, the point is just like, hey, this is so important that we're going to, you know, you can't figure it out in an interview and we should all have eyes wide open expectations around that. And, you know, very, very rarely do we hire somebody who doesn't make it through that, but but it kind of sets up a construct where it's a natural conversation to have if it's just not working out. Yeah, it, you know, you, you bring up so many things to unpack there, Mike, and, and, and one of them is the great failing of um, the interview process, generally speaking, because it is so much of it seems to be sort of formulaic um, and and we need, all of us need to be really much better at our human skills at actually looking at and reading that person rather than just the answer. <clears throat> and oftentimes somebody's trained in HR to interview somebody and they're really going through by route rather than actually saying, oh, I see that this person is more that way. So I've got to come at this in a different way. And, and you know, it's interesting that I'm saying that because you came into this, as you said, you know, you, you started this business and before you'd not been in business, you not done those kinds of things, you're not worked in corporate. So, I, you know, you've obviously got this massive resume of success now, but let's sort of walk it back a bit because I want people to sort of have a sense of that. Um, you know, you built this global team, FreshBooks, as I said, is the number one accounting firm in the cloud. But let's go back into, you know, is there a turning point in your leadership in your business philosophy? I, I think there was, um, uh, let's go with archeology span instead of strip mining. Like I, I think as a process to discover it within myself and mm -hmm. to get to a place where we could articulate it. And, you know, I think the great beauty of not having worked anywhere else was we've done everything by first principles, right? Because you got to figure it out for the first time. And yeah. you know, some of these things are mysterious. And I've spent more time trying to figure culture out than, than, than some other folks. I think it's, you know, and not everyone, like there's lots of people who've taken this on very much as well. I, I don't yeah. want to you know, have anyone think I, you know, I want to minimize anyone else's effort or make anyone think that I'm, I'm the foremost expert on this. But I, I, I spent more time and attention here than, uh, you know, and that was, and by the way, it's, it's clearly a thing of passion for me. <laughs> sure. Like I'm, I'm intellectually curious about it. I believe it helps drive business results. And so, um, you know, no regrets and will continue to, to, to be curious around it. Um, so, so, so what is, what is my point? I think, I think those are all just, you know, parts of what's gotten us from, from here to there and, and uh, you know, hopefully helpful. And, and sorry, so, I lost the thread there. Yeah. Well, so uh, let me bring it to this. Um, when you, 
when you come into the business world for the first time and you're in a corporate position, um, you're building up that business, there comes a point, you know, you're hiring people to help you do little bids and bobs. That's the entrepreneurial process. And then, and this is one of the things I see with entrepreneurs all the time, there comes a point when you go, oh, okay, I got to hire an executive. <laughs> I got to hire somebody with a ton of experience um, and not just somebody who's enthusiastic. Um, and that is often the wall for them because they get yeah. either, they go into uh, a sense of um, imposter syndrome um, or they go into uh, hiring somebody who's exactly like them and that's a terrible failure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you for uh, steering me there. Um, that was certainly a turning point for us. Uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, we scaled the organization. We got to about a hundred people, and um, you know, I uh, and I think entrepreneurs get a bad rap a lot, and I, you know, I probably had one and, and probably deserved it. But everything was running through me. I was this big bottleneck, and, and I was I was really getting in the way of. And people were like, "You're a control freak," and I, you know, in you know, for me, I was like, "I don't want to be doing this." But I don't see how we reliably get good decisions made, you know, where, where we're not there. And I had I had great people around me, but the point is none of them was an actual executive. And right. so I tried to hire people who I thought were, but there's another there's whole other air quotes class of animal yeah. um, standard of uh, ability where um, eventually we hired one of those. It was our CTO at the time. We we're kind of like 120 people. And that was a watershed moment for me. And, and the challenge, so the, before we get to why it was a watershed moment, like why did it take so long? Why it takes so hard? It's like, it's it's terrifying. You don't know. Like I, you know, I didn't like, you know, for me even figuring out what the heck a CEO was, having never worked sure. in a place before and bringing definition to that was hard. And then it's like hire an executive, terrifying uh, prospect. Uh, we hired a VP marketing early on. I thought they were just going to take my job. You know, it's like, they're so much more accomplished <laughs> than me. They'd run all this stuff. And Right, anyway, the whole, like I said, the whole imposter syndrome thing comes up. Yeah, yeah, and and so it's it's um, you know it, it's complicated. But anyway, we finally got one of those, and then I spent the next like twelve to eighteen months, and we we rebooted the whole the whole group, and like all of a sudden now we had a whole bunch of those, and so it's it, it can be a breakthrough because the only thing that scales is is these kinds of leaders, right? And then you need to eventually, then you're like, okay, now I know we're gonna have to keep doing this process now, growing people, but. But at least I know there's another standard out here. I know my problems can be solved by, by finding the right people. But I have no pattern recognition <laughs> with hiring these people. You get, right. you know, it's it's another standard. Don't even know the questions to ask, the things to look for. And so for me, um, you know, all of this comes from a, you know, if you start from the place of like the most valuable asset you have is your people, and it's the most important thing to get right, then then spend time on it. I, I am very much a slow to hire air quotes, fast to fire, you know, sort of orientation. Um, and when I say slow to hire, I'm very deliberate. I'll talk to a lot of people. Most of my executive searches are six to nine months in length, uh, which, you know, is just is what it is. And maybe people would say that's not uncommon, but um, I, uh, you know, people talk about these three month searches and I'm like, I've had like two of those over 20 years. <laughs> right. And that's working with a professional search firm to be clear and like yeah. brand products here. Like it just, it doesn't, um, it just doesn't, you know, work that way in my opinion. That's because I'm looking for, you know, I'm looking for something that's, you know, harder to find or that doesn't always come, come forward. So um, anyhow, it, it is, uh, I just, I believe there is a great imperative um, to to find people who are going to fit and who are going to build and who are are different than you and can do the things you can't. Um, you know, fun fact: I, I have always compensated my executives more than myself because uh, I can't do their job. Right? Uh, they're all better at their things than me. I, I can't do it, and I, I like the moral authority of being able to say, "Hey, like you're paid more than me, so let's let's not go too far with any uh, funny business <laughs> or sure. compensation." But but it is, um, you know, they're the experts in their area and we're grateful to have them. But, you know, that's again is the, that's part of the difference of having a culture-based as opposed to a profit-based organization. Of course, we have to make profit to be in business. I'm not saying anything about that, but your culture is clearly first. Uh, and that culture is not only the fit with the uh, skill set and the, uh, and the abilities, but the fit with what the culture is, as in who we are and what we're about. 
And it brings me to this piece that I find very interesting. And I want to bring it to you because, you, you know, you say culture is first. And I certainly don't disagree with that at all. But there's an interesting piece here because we're now, there's a lot of talk about diversity. And certainly I'm in favor of diversity. But I've often said, um, I think every, not everybody, most people miss the boat on diversity. And what I mean by that is, the, they simply hire a black person, a white person, a transgender person, a gay person, whatever it is that is part of that diversity, you know, again, in air quotes, what it is. And what they're actually hiring is the same people who just have those orientations or those cultural backgrounds. That It's the same people. They're not actually hiring for diversity, which for me is cognitive diversity. So how do you balance the cognitive diversity with the values alignment because a lot of people see that as a uh, maybe even as opposing i i don't but maybe talk to us about how you confront well well well, so one thing i don't want to speed over with that assessment is i I do believe if you draw people uh you know from the kinds of groups you were speaking about their lived experience will be different than say my own absolutely And, and that that brings a diversity of lived experience and, and background that that is is valuable. Okay, so I don't want to minimize Absolutely. the importance of like even just by the color of your skin. You know, there's a different lived experience in this world Absolutely. today. And Couldn't agree more. So so that's that's thing one. Thing two is cognitive diversity. Um, and so yes, I, I like. You absolutely want, you do not want group think. You want people who are going to challenge you, you know, uh, all, all these kinds of things and challenge you in good ways, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it may not always be comfortable, right? Yeah. Uh, people who are going to push you, you're probably going to push for things. So, so yes, I, I think, I, and I think you can get very comfortable. Uh, I've always, we've always tried to play the anti nepotism thing at FreshBooks, which is, um, you know, if you know the person, you know, you can refer them, but you cannot have a part in the interview process, right? right? It doesn't matter who you are, what role it is, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I've had, you know, executives who've had, you know, kids and they're like, hey, summer job. And I'm like, they can go to the process and see if they get through, right? It's yeah. because I, I, I think, I think you, um, you lose a lot of moral authority and goodness in a culture if people think decisions are being made for for those uh, those kinds of reasons. But, but also, if you're playing in those, so sort of, let's call them nepotism pools, which are smaller circles and known to everybody, yeah. it can start to be, you can start to foster very much a group think, you know, kind of behind the scenes culture of, uh, you know, classically old boys club is a, a one way of referring to it. And there are certainly other ones and you could have it, you know, no matter what gender or what have you for sure develop based on based on how you hire. And let me go ahead and say for startups out there, it's very hard because you're often working, you're trying to hire people and get going and you have people who are known to your teams and all that kind of thing. And it's, it is very hard, but I, I think as soon as you can get to the the anti-nepotism approach, I think the better off you will be and the more diversity you will you will foster, right? Because somebody got in on their, I mean, I don't want to use the word uh, their own- On their own merit of some kind. Well, of some kind, right? There's a, there's, there's a, there's a hurdle. It's not as simple as I knew somebody, yeah. uh, which I think is a bad, you know, kind of bad for business kind of thing. And this is also true, by the way, when we hire any executives and uh, yeah. they like, hey, I know some people from my team. It's like, great. You're out of the process. You can put them in. We'll see how it goes. Uh, I think that's yeah. again very healthy, lest you uh, uh, just kind of recreate, you know, clubbiness. Yeah, I, I actually I love that you approach it that way. Now I want to go into the the other part of this, which is the thing I talked about right at the very beginning. And you and I talked about it when we, when we had our previous conversation, using blind dates to create a more collaborative workplace. Um, I think this is very fresh it's um fresh books sorry uh it's a, it's a fresh approach um and i know that you've um you've been featured on some of the major media because of it so talk, talk to us about this yeah. idea um of blind gates and i'm sure they're not taking place in that room that you're in right now because unless those people are from the 70s <laughs> well, <laughs> so we, go, uh, i'm gonna date with you i love the wallpaper <laughs> The yeah, COVID this, this, wall, 
this wallpaper is now featured as background across across the company as a as a joke, and it's it's probably about seventy five years old. Uh, just is so it you really? know, that. yeah, oh yeah. This is, uh, um, okay, so let's let's go with blind dates, and I, I think it's helpful that I to kind of get the story on this. And so, yes, yeah. our company has conducted um, you know blind dates in the workplace. But let me let me take that headline and unpack it for you. Sure. Uh, we had, um, uh, and and this is a story, by the way, of what culture will will provide for you if you if you if you start that way. So um, we um, at FreshBooks, everybody spends their first month in customer service. Uh, so you come in, so wanna, you get trained. I want to put a pause in that right there because I think you know when we, you and I talked, that right there was like that is so simple and so powerful. So if so let's say you're your CFO. Did that person spend a spend a month in customer service right away? He was a public company CFO for 10 years before he joined and he spent a month in customer service. How awesome is that? You spend a month in customer service before you do anything else. Get off your high horse, experience the customer, find out what it's like for them. Love that. I just wanted, like, I, you know, when you told me that, I wanted to high five you right there. I thought it was like, <laughs> you know, put a pin in that one. That is awesome. Well, and, and let's spend a little time on it because uh, we've gotten so many things for free because of that. Uh, and we do do some training. So we give you the history of the company and the metrics and all this stuff. And like the first two weeks is training. And then we're training you up on the product and the customer. And that's two weeks of kind of answering calls and, and responding to people. So it's a, you know, it's a full month and it's very uh, kind of regimented. It's a ton of fun. And by the way, it was born out of our incredible support team who's curated and still actually runs it today, which is kind of fascinating in and of its own right. Anyhow, um, so the very first full-time support person we had. So we always did this back in the basement. We hired a software engineer and they would handle the support for a while and then we hired all these other roles and we got to probably in the neighborhood of 15 20 people when we hired our first full time because prior to that everyone around the company was rotating and sure. doing you know like a week or a day or whatever yeah, the, the, the many hats routine of, of entrepreneurship <laughs> well and very very deliberately sending people back like oh you've been here for two years it's time you're going to do a week in support again so it was a really interesting mechanism to just keep people close to the customer Anyhow, the first full-time uh, support person we hired was uh, this woman, Grace, and she um, she had been with us for a number of years, and we'd gone from you know the 15, 20 when she joined to, let's call it, I don't know, 300 or something like this, mm -hmm. and, and um, the thing, because everybody spends their first month in, in customer service, and by the way, because we only had one office, the support team would meet 100% of people who joined the company. OK. And for years, Grace would like, you know, give everybody a hug on their first day. And that was a thing. And then, you know, as you grow and scale, you realize, you know, unfortunately, these are things you can't really do in the workplace anymore for a variety of reasons. So Grace doesn't do that anymore. But but what she started to realize is she like sat and had lunch in the lunch hall or what have you is um, is, hey, wait a second. Um, people don't know each other anymore. Like I know everybody because they come through support. I spent mm -hmm. like a month with them, but not everybody knows each other. And that for her was like, huh, that's not great. What can we do about this? And so what she decided to do on her own, you know, without asking, which is a great thing, is she just shot an email out and said, hey, I'm doing a little thing. I will set you up on a blind date with, you know, someone else in the company. Uh, I'll do, she's basically playing matchmaker. Now, yeah. you might think, you know, she's playing matchmaker in a romantic sense. She was very much playing matchmaker in a basically department experience sense and trying to say, hey, who would not have interacted naturally necessarily before? And so I'll take somebody from finance and put them with someone in software. And um, and we usually did groups of three or four. So it wasn't like two people. And the, the idea would be like they just have like an hour meeting and have coffee or what have you. And and that was that was the idea. And so then the question is like, well, OK nice tagline, you know, pretty funny. What's the benefit of this? And so for me, th this was just amazing because what you get out of this is I, I just have a belief that, you know, people want to feel connected to the company. And, yes. and part of the way you feel connected is you have shared history with basically more people in more areas. And so this was a way of facilitating that. Another thing that happens when you have more shared history and what have you is you have just more trust and more information flow. And people bump into each other in the hallway and they say, oh, like, 
oh, we're, I'm working on this thing right now. And it's like, oh, you're working on that. And because they went out and spent an hour together, you know, you learn about that or they trade notes in that hour. And so you're basically fostering network development through mm -hmm. the company in, in what would not as easily or naturally happen kinds of ways. And so, you know, we all of a sudden get, you know, two hiring managers, one talking about how to hire for technical skills, one talking about how to hire for fit, that is like a benefit from one of those things. And so uh, anyhow, there's just not all these knock on implications. And so, yeah, so we, so Grace went ahead and did that. She sent an email, she had a huge response. She ran three of them over 75% of the company had participated in one, which was super cool. And, uh, and then CBS News took an interest and they gave us like 15 minutes on CBS Morning Show uh, because, uh, because they heard about it. So that's, you know, that's, that's another whole thing around how to, how to earn media. But, but um, that was, uh, it, was just, it was just something we did and we told the world and uh, it turns out people were interested. Well, I mean, I think that what's lovely about that and extraordinarily beneficial, of course, is that it is a silo destroyer. It destroys the silos because you know part of the problem with a with a normal normal corporate entity uh, i know that i've been brought in lots of times to try and tear down the silos and you know the biggest part of that is um you know you in your silo think they in their silo are different than you right and you know because i understand the psychology of tribes and how they work you know, you just create, you, you say, well, we have a culture. No, you don't. You have tribes who have their own culture. And if your culture is going to override the tribes, the tribes, uh, the, the silos have to break down. How do you do that? There's only one way. Move people into those tribes and have them come together, right? And, and how do you do that? You find commonality, common ground, because marketing hates sales and sales hates marketing. And they both hate uh, accounting, you know? So, you know, and the first time we did this was, I think it was 2004, we worked with a uh, global company and I had everybody in the executive board. Uh, so the executive team rather on the executive team change positions for one month. They had to shadow for one month that person and then change position. And, and, oh my God, the level of appreciation for, oh my God, how do you do this? I, you know, I wanted to kill everybody. Thank you for what you do. Instead of, my God, you're a pain in the ass and you don't know what you're doing. It was fantastic. But it's, that, it's the only way to break the silos is like, you know, it's the, the rule of empathy. Walk a mile in the moccasins. Yeah, I think that the shared experience and just kind of putting people together. And so we've always worked on like, hey, how do we build shared history that's, you know, kind of cross company and, and little things like having an open lunch area is a great thing to do it at a certain size. And it just gets harder. And so this is the thing about culture as you scale up and, you know, throw in remote and COVID and everything like that is like, how do you chip away at this all the time? And it is, it is, it is not easy, uh, but it is actually really long-term important right you don't you don't see it at the beginning people get to get in the silos they also find a department they get a great department pride or whatever to the exclusion of all others and it's like that will just come back and bite you in ways you know you never want it to and so the question is you know are you thinking long term enough and then what are you doing to kind of get ahead of um you know the, tr the, the almost like the natural um direction of things Right. Uh, which is like, oh, I am motivated to serve this executive under here and not worry too much about, you know, crossing over there. And that's uh, that's just a it's just such a narrow, narrow view. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we work at a, just creating a lot of cross company, you know, events, time together, interactions. And, and that's that's been our thing. But we're, we're we're like 500 going on a thousand and still early days and a ton of work to do because we're not, you know, 10,000 yet or whatever. I'm sure it'll be a whole other ball game by then. And uh, I don't know what we're going to do to <laughs> solve all those problems. So so let's take this to something that is very contemporary. Um, you know, we're talking about culture and everybody's had a punch in the culture lately. And it's called COVID you know, because everything went remote. And, you know, some companies were dominantly remote before. It was not, it's not been a big deal for them. 
uh, some, you know, had the walk around culture, you could bump into people. Um, where we're going is, you know, people talking about going back to normal. Normal's not going to happen. That's done. We're moving on. And what will come is definitely some form of a hybrid. There'll be some time in the office and a lot of people will be remote. Um, and more than 60% of people who have been working remotely say they do not intend to return to work on a full-time basis. They may come back a couple of days a week, but that's it. They don't need to. Um, and many of them have moved out into, you know, rural areas or wherever it is, and they can work and they, they enjoy that. Talk to us about your approach in the context of culture in this beginning of this very hybrid world of uh, remote versus on-site and keeping the culture, you know, really nailed down while people are in sort of distant from, from the yeah. central hub. Yeah, so let me expose some, some biases and some history so people just know where I'm coming from and the leanings, and then we can just talk about what we think is going to happen and some of the things we're going to do. So so um, for a lot of years, we built the company in, in one office, kind of one office, one culture, right, which is yeah. not the case of a lot of companies. And so we, we really did not have a lot of remote work. Uh, we did have people who over the years had been in that office and we wanted to retain and for life events could be a spouse could be need to go take care of a family member. They had to leave. And so we're like, oh, we'll retain you. And so we started learning how to work a little bit remote. But, you know, I would say very much, very much at the margins. Um, and then we kind of got into our first next office and, you know, which is then Amsterdam and quickly added another one in Raleigh. So we went to three offices. And so, you know, going into COVID, we had operationally started the journey yes. and, and learning how to do some of these things. So we were lucky, but we were not, you know, remote first or any of these kinds of things. And then along comes COVID and you get pushed to the nth degree. Yep. And um, so given all of this, I'll expose my, my personal biases. I, I think those, you know, the 60% is overstated. I, I, I think that there will be um, just as it kind of was before there people, a lot of people do want to work, in an office culture. And there's a lot of emphasis put on that. Now, it's not going to be 100% of people. And if that's your expectation for your workforce, you're going to miss out on a lot of talent. Uh, right. So I think there'll be a lot of people doing hybrid, you know, I'll probably be one of those three, three, four days a week, you know, it sounds sounds great, but but it's still going to want to go back. And, and I think other people will as as well, just opinion mine, because you get certain intangible things. So that's, that's kind of my, hey, philosophical, where do I think we're going to net out? Um, you know, and so maybe, maybe it's like a third, a third, a third, a third remote, sure. you know, a third that are hybrid and a third, there are going to be people and I would say departments. So the way, the way we're tackling it at, at FreshBooks is, hey, each executive leader is going to get to determine what needs to happen for their department. Uh -huh. And they might have teams or functions inside of their thing where it's, to your point, the non-negotiable. Right. right. You actually, this is an in-office role 100% of the time, or until you have tenure of X and you, you know you're on on your way. But you think about developing a sales team, and if you're, you know, trying to get, you know, and like we have a sales group that's calling into people and all this stuff. The, the learning cycles, you know, joining an organization, maybe it's your first job in sales, learning a customer, a product, and how to sell when you're not sitting next to other people and listening to how they do that. It's just it's just going to slow down and thwart development, and I think a lot of organizations are are experiencing that. And so those are like, hey, when the office is back, those will be in office roles, and you know, at the eighteen month mark, if you've demonstrated competency or whatever, you can start to you know think about it a little differently. But this the point is, hey, different executive leaders are going to choose to do things differently, and then we're going to have a job to do. Uh, and then we've got now we've got five offices in five countries. Uh, we added, you know, two of those in COVID. So we went from three to five in the middle of COVID, which is, you know, kind of very interesting in its own own way. And sure. um, and so uh, so so with that in mind, what, what we're going to be doing is building out a global workforce um, that, you know, no matter who you are, you're tied to an office. And so this gets back to like, how do you connect things? So that's that's all just context, a little bit of philosophy, some more context. So so I think then, hey, what is the job to do here? Um, when we come back. Mm -hmm. And if you go and you go and talk with any um, longtime, you know, remote company or remote first, and I like to reference Matt Mullenweg, who's the founder of, of WordPress and their, you know, their 
I don't know how many thousand people and they've been remote forever. Um, you know, he will be the first to tell you like, just cause you're remote, like you, you have to work on relationships. You have to invest in them. You have to develop them critically, critically, critically important. And, you know, we've always believed that in the office, I think you have to be even more deliberative. You won't get as much for free in, in a remote or a demi remote world. Um, and so the question is, so what do you do? And so we're looking at, okay, everyone's tied to an office. You know, we need to do all company events, you know, probably a couple times a year. Yeah, because we're maybe a little heavier. A lot of the companies would say one time a year. Maybe we're going to do it two, two times. And then, I, you know, I think you're going to have regional departments. So if you're remote, like we're just setting the expectation, like once a month, you're going to have, if you're remote, that still means like once a month, you're participating in something in your local office. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's good. So that's going to include travel and what have you. And we're like running the math of like, oh, remote's going to save you a lot of money. It's like, hey, if you're really going to invest in relationship health, which is going to mean getting together in the physical world at some periodic basis, if you throw the travel expenses in, in that, like you're probably not saving as much as you think. Mm -hmm. But that's going to be what it's going to take to sustain relationships and culture and, and, and actually keep that because without the relationships, the silos get worse, the information doesn't flow, the trust isn't there, like you have to have it. And so I think people will foolishly think, you know, they'll swing too far. And I even think, I think employees, uh, you know, I've seen like, hey, mentally, oh, this remote thing's great. That's what I'm going to do forever. I don't know how many people I've hired who used to work remote and then they decide they want to come back to an office culture. So like none of these things are true forever. Uh, I think it's just like this, people are just, you know, they're just so unaware of how, influence they are by recency and current events and everything like that so anyhow that's that's kind of i'll stop there because that's probably well, more than I, enough and, for me and i don't that. disagree with anything you're saying uh nonetheless i think there's a very high possibility that people will um or people let me rephrase that that um c-suite will easily um let go of a lot of cultural things that they should be very hanging on to very strongly. And, and of course, the, the number one thing of that is relationships. Um, so, you know, and, you know, because of my background in psychology, I'll, you know, one of the things I say to people is, listen, people are, people are working remotely. They love that they're home to have dinner with the kids and with their family and they can still work a couple of hours and and they're saving tons of time on 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 travel in and out and they don't have to deal with traffic and all those stresses and as a result they've been able to move to remote areas and buy better property and and build a shed in the yard that's now the office or a, a bedroom that's closed off yeah all those are things are true but there's also people going get me the hell out of here I want to go to work because I can't focus. I need an environment. Or there are people who are deeply relational who are saying, you know, I'm kind of lonely here on this world. And But it's not going to be an either or. And this is what I think is the big mistake is that there are going to be people who are like, definitely, you know, get me the hell away from my family. I would like to kill them all and I need to go to work. And there's going to be people who are like, you know, I don't have any interest in going back because I really enjoy being at home with the family. But most people, as you say, are going to be somewhere in the middle. And the, the what I'm asking about and, and challenging people on is, how are you going to keep the culture alive for those three groups? The ones who are all in it coming back, the ones who are all in it staying out, and the ones who are in the middle, who are the hybrid version, because you've got to translate culture to all three environments and it, it will be very easy to see the bias of, well, you're more involved in the culture because you're here four days a week or five days a week. Whereas Johnny, he only comes in two days a month. And that's what I'm asking you about. You know, do, what do you think is the way that, to bring that together on a more regular basis? And, and maybe you've not considered that yet, and maybe you have. Well, well, I think, I mean, I think it's, if we go back to like, hey, what is culture? It's like, what happens when no one's looking, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think I think the effort on leadership is to, to basically make the time. We have a value um, 
which is um, we are playful and we make time for fun. It, it's like, call it fun. But the idea is like literally baked into our culture is you got to recognize you have to spend time and maybe that's team building or it's just going out for dinner or what have you. Some of these things are just harder. And I think, so I think leaders are just going to have to ascribe more time. There will be more like off sites. There'll be more department gatherings. I think this is going to be a great thing for the industry that has like event space <laughs> because, mm -hmm. you know, corporations are going to start spending a ton more on like, now we have to host more department events to actually just bring people together and share knowledge. It doesn't, it's not like we can just gather in the, we have a room called the presentorium. Like that's where you can host an all company meeting. Like it's not going to be that useful or not as useful anymore. And, um, and I think, you know, once you get off site or whatever, there's more relationship building that happens. So, so anyways, I think, I think those are going to be good industries to be in uh, post pandemic because there'll be more demand. <laughs> uh, obviously they've been uh, really challenged uh, the last, uh, you know, year and a bit. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I think it's just going to be timed up and I think that's going to be hard. And so in the absence of it, I think what you're going to get is a little bit like what we're seeing right now with COVID is, is burnout, you know, in part because the relationships are there. So you don't have as much meaning. You're not as tied to the organization, you know, good chance that you're going to start to see um, tenures, you know, shorten and people just switching and it's more transactional. And therefore you're going to lose a lot of the, the, the IP and knowledge, you know, in, mm. in your workforce, right? Like I think people, massively discount the value of keeping a time to, a team together sometimes because they yeah. just know a lot of stuff right, right. Um, and you know it's hard enough already with you know all the data on like millennials and all the rest of it so I think this will be an accelerant by the way I'll go one further and say I just think there's a huge you know everybody's going to be suffering like an attrition problem coming out of COVID because there's going to be so many people who are like okay the vaccines are good I can get out again I made it through I just need a change or, or whatever it is. And so I'm hopeful that, you know, that change is going to be, I'm going to start going back to the office for a lot of our people. But, yeah. I, but I think there's going to be a lot of people and a lot of companies that's just like wholesale change. This is, we survived, we got the other side, you know, set me free. Uh, and it's going to be very interesting. It's, it's very interesting, Mike, because I, I think that a lot of leaders are thinking, you know, uh, because so many people were furloughed or laid off, that they're going to have the upper hand again. Whereas before COVID, it was definitely in the talent war, talent won, and talent were deciding where they wanted to go. Um, and I think a lot of companies since COVID have thought, you know what, well, we're going to have the upper end again. And I'm like, mm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that that's going to be the case. I think that people are going to just have itchy feet uh, about getting out of the house or doing something different, you know. And so, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think that people are going to want something else. Well, and I also think there's just, you know, there's been a lot of burnout in a lot of places and it's kind of thankless and you can't see people and you don't even necessarily appreciate it because you're like the executive just gets, you will be judged. Yes. People are going to like, you know, judgment day is coming and hey, how is this organization for me during this? And, you know, it's a lot easier to be more immune from this as a leader today because you can't walk the halls or what, like for me, you know, I'll just like, I, I do like to walk the halls. I do like to learn from people I don't see every day. I think that's really important. Now it's, you know, like I just see who I see on Zoom. You know, there's yep. no, the, the, the collisions, I do work at it to try and put myself in, in the way of various constituent groups. So I get some of it. And that's one of the things I think, I hope everyone's been doing more skip levels and all this stuff to kind of overcome yep. this over this period. But, but um, yeah, I think, I think some folks, you know, Hopefully, you know, they're just going to be in for a rude awakening. Yeah, it, it's a really good point. Now, as we draw towards the end of the show, there are a couple of things I always like to ask at the end. One, of course, is how can people find out more about you? And we'll certainly get to that. Um, but one of the key things I, 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 I'm driven by in, in this show is I, I'm very blessed and honored that I get to have these wonderful conversations with people like yourself who are outstanding at what they're doing um and it's very easy for someone to sit listening or doing whatever they're doing watching the show and go yeah but and make an excuse you know i'm not like mike because of x y or z so one of the things that i always want to know is you know tell us a little bit about the major hurdle for you because 
they're saying, I'm not like Mike. I don't have 150, 300 people. I don't have a global company. I don't have five countries. I, you know, so it's different. It's right. not, but I, I get that excuse. So I always want my, my guests to share something that's a little bit personal about that struggle for them and how they got over that hurdle. So the person on the end can go, yeah, that's I, okay. If he can do it, maybe I can. Um, it, it is a it is a great question, and there are so many, so many reasons to know that you are probably be, better off and, and better at a bunch of this stuff than me. And if you put it in context and comparison, so so those of you know, like, yeah, the first thing is you got to understand I'm standing on nearly two decades of trying to solve these problems and think about it. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think the first thing, the most important thing, and I say this to entrepreneurs all the time, who or would be entrepreneurs, is um, you know just going on the journey, right? Anyone can do. And that's a you thing. That's not anybody else. It's just like, you know, go, go on the journey and choose to do that. But so for me, I, I'll just, you know, I've had lots of challenges along the way. Uh, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't cogently articulate any of this in 2006, <laughs> right? I, I knew it was interesting. I, I, I was impassioned to learn more, but I, I didn't have the, the, you know, the air quotes command of that that I, I do today. And, and I'll go ahead and say, I think like anything in leadership, like it, it just doesn't end. You're constantly working on it. Maybe the situation changes, maybe new research that's important changes, you know, all, all these kinds of things. And so on the personal struggle standpoint, like, yeah, you're talking to a guy who made it all seem great. But, you know, the first 10 years of my career was, you know, a seemingly, well, I would say a very directive entrepreneur right, who was making a lot of decisions for people and not leaving a lot of space in the room for people to feel like they were making their own. And um, you know, some of my hurdles were just, it, and it took a while for, um, you know, some advisors to get, get through to me and were very helpful, but, you know, one of, one of, I guess your super strengths can really hold you back. So, I, you know, I can generally have a conversation, get the information and make the decision now. And I don't, generally need to sleep for two nights to get to it. Sometimes I will, but you know, more often than not, I can, I yeah. can come up with stuff live. And, um, and as a founder and a CEO, like, you know, when you do that live, it, it, it can, if you answer a question first, because you have the answer, it doesn't leave a lot of space for other people. And that, that is, I think, you know, that in a nutshell is perhaps the single greatest challenge I've been working on for years is to slow down you know, to let everyone else answer first. Um, you know, it generally doesn't change my answer. <laughs> this is the thing. I think people think like, oh, you've heard from us all now. It's different. It's like, no, you know, I haven't. It's, you know, for better or for worse, actually, no. Uh, but I got there in real time. But, you know, there's this job to to take a deep breath and hold. And it is exhausting for me to do that. And so mm -hmm. uh, the, the point is, um, you know, hey, I, I am still way far from perfect. You know, uh, if you don't have that problem going for you, you, you probably, you know, like, and, and that's hard on people. You know, I think that was, you know, like, hey, we have a meeting or whatever. We got some stuff and Mike's just firing out answers to stuff. Like, that's not really that great a time. Uh, no, and, and I think it, it, it chokes innovation. It chokes innovation because what becomes is there's no psychological safety for the other person to come up with an idea. And even though you may have already come to the conclusion three minutes in, um, it doesn't mean that it's not refined by those responses. You may still be at the same response, but the refinement of it might be that little tiny tweak can sometimes be all the thing that makes all the difference. And I always want to caution leaders around that and saying, you know, don't choke innovation by being the guy with the answers because nobody gets safe enough to say, I've got an idea because Mike's is going to be better or Fred's is going to be better. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's a good point. I think the other one that really started to influence me even more than that, Dove, was I actually wanted them to do it. And so this notion of feeling like you own it and it was yours is is more impactful um, in terms of your motivation and your drive to do it and go ahead and refine it and get it and become like an entrepreneur in the building, which is kind of what you want to perpetuate. And so, so when you, you start to realize like how answering takes away from that and even yeah. how just waiting to speak last, you know, 
doesn't take away nearly as much, <laughs> even if you're saying the same thing. Like those are just hard lessons for this guy to learn. Well, I think that those are gr those are great lessons for particularly anybody who's who's moved into a senior position through the entrepreneurial path, not through the corporate path, but through the, the entrepreneurial path, because there is the tendency to want to get into the driver's seat, even when it's not your vehicle, right? And so that's a that's a really good input. Thank you. Um, as we come to the end now, Mike, I just want to ask you, please, would you be willing to share with our audience two things? One, a simple practical thing that they can do in context of what it is you've been talking about today. And then tell us where, you, where, where people can find out more about you and all your resources. So I think uh, just on the last point, I guess, for context, we'll go to the culture thing. Um, you know, I think one of the most important things I do now is I go for a walk every morning. And it's dangerously close to meditation, but to clear your mind and quiet yourself before the day begins. And I didn't used to make time for that. I just get up and going. And I think, you know, I think for everyone, you know, that time will pay uh, huge dividends. Uh, just go for a walk, clear your head in the morning. Uh, you, will be, you will be a better leader. Uh, with regards to culture and, and things you can do is... Um, I, uh, there's, there's the, and I, I kind of forget the firm. I think it's like the company that Yum Brands actually, that owns the, uh, you know, like Kentucky Fried Chicken, all this stuff. The, you, you can go look it up, but this, right? the, yeah, there's a CEO there. I don't remember uh, his name, but he talked about like people are like, well, how'd you do the turnaround? He's like, well, it's the rubber chicken, right? And, and what he does is he gives away a rubber chicken as a sign of like, hey, you did something well. And, and my point is, you know, to you, what's one thing you can do is just focus on recognizing people when they're doing what you want them to, right? That is a, it is, it is a bit of like a thing to go ahead and learn um, to do if it doesn't come naturally. Like for me, I'm always like on to the next thing, but to slow down and recognize that and do it kind of publicly, that will start to, you know, help people understand what you're looking for in terms of culture, in terms of results or, or what have you. So those would be uh, two things. Fabulous. Thank you. So how can people find out more about you, Mike, and all the things that you offer, all your resources? How can people get in touch with you? What's, what, tell us how to do that. Yeah, so if you're, you're running a firm, you need some accounting software, please go ahead and check out uh, FreshBooks. Um, they can do that at freshbooks.com. There's a free trial. And that's a path to learning more about me as well. I'm on Twitter at Mike McDermott as probably the most uh, active social media thing for me these days. Uh, right. But if you go search the web, you'll if you want to, you know, if you, for whatever reason, you'd still want to hear more from me. There's uh, all kinds of interviews and things like there. And, uh, you know, do, do reach out. I'm just Mike at FreshBooks if I can be helpful. Fabulous. Well, I want to thank you, Mike, for, for today. Thank you for all the wisdom that you shared. It's been great. And I know that there's a lot of value here for everybody. And uh, for you, dear listener, of course, but remember that we will post all those links that Mike just mentioned onto the show notes. So you'll be able to get them uh, wherever you are listening to us from. And uh, we, if you want to hang out with other conscious leaders and chat about this episode, you've been listening to or any past episodes, you can go to our Facebook or LinkedIn groups. Just look for the Leadership and Loyalty podcast. It doesn't matter how successful you are. If your employees and your customers don't understand what gives your company meaning, you're only working at a fraction of your capability. To find out how you can hire me, Dov Barron, as a speaker, leadership strategist for yourself or your organization, simply go to Dov baron.com that's d-o-v-b-a-r-o-n.com because unified meaning is the one single monolithic difference between mediocrity and greatness for all individuals and companies finding that one monolithic difference it's so powerful for you so i want to thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know till next time stay curious my friends stay curious about how you can upgrade your culture one blind date at a time. I'm Dov Barron and I'm here to assist you tapping into your dragon fire to reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out.